All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so today I will just like you know complete the like you know the last part of vaccination and then summarize basically what vaccines are and then how they are useful for us. So in case you have noticed, you know, till yesterday we have seen the different kinds of what exactly a vaccine is, and then we have seen the different types of vaccines that is like. Uh, uh, vaccines or attenuated vaccines, then inactivated vaccines. Then uh, you have used uh, purified macromolecules. That is the uh, the uh, like you know cell wall of the bacteria. That is the purified mac uh, macromolecules that, that have been used as uh, uh, vaccines. Then you have seen toxoid vaccines, and uh, uh, you have seen even the recombinant vaccines for that matter. So when it comes to the recombinant vaccines, you get to see that. Basically, in recombinant vaccines, you have genetic, uh, like, you know, the genes. They encode the antigens, right? So what you use is you use the genetic material of the pathogens. And then these this genetic material that has this, uh, like, you know, which is encoding the antigen property of the pathogens is taken, added to the attenuated viruses or bacteria, that is the microbes, then this serves as a vector. Then replicating within the host, this express the gene product of the pathogen. So a number of organisms are actually used as vector vaccines. So this includes the vaccinia virus and then the carinipox virus. Then, you know, you have attenuated polio viruses, adenoviruses, ad uh, like, and uh, then uh, strains of salmonella, which have been attenuated, that is weakened. And then the BCG strain of the mycobacterium bovis, so and certain uh, streptococci, and also like you know whatever oral cavity uh, like you know bacteria that are existing, they're all of uh, the recombinant type of vaccines that are available. And recently, you have another type of vaccines that have come up. That is the DNA vaccines, in which what happens is the plasmids, which the DNA, like you know, the plasmid DNA, this has the antigenic protein. This is injected directly into the muscle of the patient or the recipient. So these muscle cells take up the DNA, and then along with the DNA, the encoded proteins are coming up. This leads to humoral immunity, and then later the cell-mediated responses. So this is one approach, which is a DNA vaccine. You inject it directly into the cells. Another approach is that you have the genetic material along with the antigen or the antigens against which you have the immune response elucidated. So body's own cells then use this genetic material to produce the antigens. Then again, towards this antigen, antibody reaction is seen. So this potential advantage is that, you know, you have a very long-term immune response and that this kind of vaccine is very stable in the body and relative large-scale uh, manufacturing can be done at the same time. So there have been quite a number of DNA vaccines that have been identified and uh, they have been using. So one is uh, like, you know, you have... SARS coronavirus, which is slightly different from a variant different from the normal COVID, whatever we are experiencing or we are exposed to right now. So this was in, so it's the SARS, the SARS virus, basically. Then against the avian influenza, that is, you must have heard the H5N1 uh, avian influenza virus in the year 2005. There was an, uh, like, you know, it was a pandemic, basically, because of which, uh, you know, many of the Southeast Asian countries had this uh, H5N1 avian influenza that they had experienced. Uh, it had come because of the exposure towards uh, poultry, basically. And then Zika virus in the year 2016. So in 2016, some of the African countries had been experiencing the Zika virus because of which, you know, uh, this DNA vaccines have helped in this. Go to Nana. <laughs> So this is all about the DNA vaccine. So when we have to summarize this particular lesson, you get to see that the term vaccine comes from the Latin vari varis like, you know, varioli vaccine, that is the cowpox. So Edward Jenner was the first person to have, uh, like, you know, prepared the uh, like, you know, vaccine or invented or developed the first vaccine to prevent the smallpox in the human beings. This vaccines give us the artificially acquired immunity. 
and then this is a ris less risky way to become immune in fact and they also prevent the disease from coming again or recurring in the first place so it is uh, like you know rather than you know after being infected with a particular uh, uh, illness instead of being affected first and then you know curing later a vaccine is wherein you know you introduce the pathogen and then you elicit an immune response so that next time you when you are exposed to the same kind of uh, pathogen then your body can uh, like you know prepare antibodies so that you know you do not or you are not affected with the same kind of pathogen so this is definitely you know uh, cheaper so you can actually say you know the prevention is better than cure actually applies in this particular area so and again scheduling of the vaccination is also important over exposure to different kinds of uh, vaccines or pathogens at the same time in the like in the form of vaccines is also not good because usually you give a vaccine uh, vaccination or the vaccines to young children that is infants and children so overloading the children with different kinds of pathogen at the same time is also not work so schedule them in proper doses and at different times of the uh, like you know the growth and then four types are again there live attenuated inactivated purified uh, macromolecules and the dna vaccines then you have again different kinds of uh, uh, various types again that is subunits recombinant polysaccharide conjugate vaccines wherein specific parts of the pathogen that is either the protein or the capsid coat or the polysaccharides are taken so this gives rise to uh, this is all about your vaccines and you also have the uh, exotoxins that is only the toxins are taken so they're known as the toxoid vaccines for that matter and inactivation with uh, formaldehyde then injected into the body because uh, the it's not the bacteria that is going to cause uh, the uh, like you know uh, issue but it is the toxin released by the bacterium so only the toxin uh, and uh, the which acts as an antigen and the antibodies against it is sufficient to elicit an immune response so all of this is regarding the vaccine now when it comes to the different kinds of concepts the scopes of animal biotechnology you get to see that we are going to see the importance of biotechnology and what exactly are the basic concepts of biotechnology and how what is the scope of biotechnology so it's a broad range of biology basically a branch of biology basic but at the same time you will learn how to use the environment the systems and the different kinds of organisms so as to develop the products for the betterment of the people and the environment around us so and the tools and the value like you know the application whatever we are using along with the scientific methods or the scientific uh, like you know products whatever are there gives rise to the biotechnology field as such so in the late uh, that is 20th and the 21st centuries biotechnology got expanded so that you start in incorporating the genomics the genetic techniques then the recombinant dna techniques then the applied immunology and pharmaceutical therapeutics diagnostics all of this were added and have made the term bio like you know biotechnology a wholly important and uh, uh, a novel field altogether so that you know all of this incorporated when we, whenever you are telling the term biotechnology so again there's a lot of uh, like you know what do you call it uh, a relationship with the uh, what do you call it uh, society when we talk about biotechnology and if you see the history of biotechnology you can get to see that it started with zymotechnology that is uh, brewing techniques for beer so the basic the first first biotechnological uh, like you know any kind of techniques that were used for the betterment of society if you get to see it was actually brewing the beer or uh, it was seen where in you know farmers how to uh, like you know select the best quality of food crops so as to get a better uh, crop yield good size of the seeds good quality of the seeds all of this so that is when selection and the breeding techniques came into existence slowly and then experienced farmers what they did was they kept maize groundnut paddy seeds that were in good size and good quality in stored houses and used them for the next crop 
so that you know you get the same kind of quality uh, of uh, like you know the uh, crops for that matter be it groundnut maize whatever so this was the first or the more foremost biotechnological methods that were the seen and then so we are talking about uh, like you know uh, bread making cheese making and beer brewing all of this they started around 6000 to 4000 uh, bc so that's a long time ago nearly around uh, from thousands of years ago since then we have seen this biotechnological principles being used at that time they did not have the term biotechnology but then you know the the principles were used it is clear that biotechnology has uh, important uh, importance in three areas that is one is healthcare then second thing is food and agriculture third thing is environmental protection so when it comes to the concepts of biotechnology you see that most of the like you know uh, mankind for food employment healthcare management you are using principles of biotechnology irrespective of whether you realize it or not so for survival purposes and to obtain food to preserve the food for that matter you have seen uh, like you know in the ancient uh, what do you call it uh, the the pyramids the tombs they had honey which was there so it was preserved it has been preserved since thousands of years so that's food preservation that was seen bread making and how to preserve that cheese and uh, you have seen biotechnology to be used for prevention of human illnesses curing human illnesses to see that you know you get good water to clean up the waste that is you have waste water management and then bioremediation techniques for that matter they'll all come later for you and by the time it was 1970s 1980s you get to see you know molecular biotechnology coming into place wherein you had rdna that is recombinant dna then you had cell fusion you had bioprocesses then you had molecular designs coming up so as to prepare uh, like you know you had uh, like you know so that you know hybridization all of that comes into place now when you see the physical traits that are coded by the basis of dna you get to see that they are found in the human chromosomes always so now what they started doing is the removal of genes from one organism insertion into the other one so that is where your rdna technology came into place now the example is that e coli so human interferon genes were put into the e coli and then because of which you know this is how the gene insertion started coming into place this is how you started getting human insulin human uh, like you know and bacterial insulin for that matter so so this is one of the examples that i'm just like citing you and then in the you know whenever you are introducing interferon genes into the bacterium this gives rise to production because bacteria can reproduce very quickly and they've got like you know what do you call it uh, uh, they can reproduce within uh, hours and you know they're very fast in replicating and you know uh, what do you call it exponential exponential growth is seen the production of the interferon within that particular bacteria that is e coli can also take place quickly so mass production of interferons is seen so this interferons can act as drugs in different kinds of cancers example is hairy cell leukemia kaposi sarcoma and different viral infections that is hepatitis virus a like you know hepatitis virus c and b etc so this is one thing and same principle for fusion of two different cells one nuclei from one cell and the uh, like you know the other cell being without e e nucleated so you are doing cell fusion this is how production of monoclonal antibodies can take place so this is again going to help you in production of antibodies which is necessary in treatment of different kinds of uh, like you know what do you call it um, infections and different kinds of cancer as well so you have your monoclonal antibody uh, process of production also after this a group which is there for which is known as bioprocess technology is a series of engineering technologies which allow genetically engineered cells and hybridomas and different kind of cells that can be grown for in large quantities so that you can have production of drugs in the mankind 
this is one thing and then you also have the mammalian cells producing the tissue plasminogen activator that is tpa or it's no, it's also known as plaque this is used in breaking down of blood clotting today you have medicines such as ecosprin that is your aspirin and clopidogrel which prevent the blood clots but if at all there is a blood clot that is already there how is it that you are going to break them down this is by using such kind of medicines so that is you know which has uh, like you know enzymes basically to break down the blood clot that is serine protease so that is your tissue plasminogen activator tpa or plaque it's known as this can be uh, grown in the mammalian cells basically using biotechnological techniques so again you have structure based molecular designs and computer aided drugs and uh, they're all uh, again you know uh, so that you know when an enzyme or a receptor is uh, like you know made enzyme hypothesis again you have lock and key hypothesis basically it's all about enzyme being you know activated so that you know enzyme plus uh, uh, like you know the substrate gives rise to uh, gives rise to the product so which is either the drug over here basically so this is used along with the uh, like you know uh, uh, molecular designs using the like you know computers so that you know this will actually help in production of the new drugs discovery and at the same time production of new drugs which can be used for other uh, like you know uh, uh, disorders wherein you do not have a uh, medicine so far also right now you have diseases wherein drugs have been discovered which can block the enzymes or the receptors which are a key position wherein you know because of which uh, like you know the disease the pathogen cycle life cycle can be stopped or that particular disease will not go forward so example is the hiv protease this is an enzyme wherein you know it inhibits the growth It, it, these are the protease inhibitors basically so what they do is they are like you know these protease inhibitors are something similar to the peptide uh, like you know uh, peptides that are present so what happens is they inhibit the action of the viral that is the hiv virus is aspartyl protease so the protease inhibitors go and block the aspartyl protease action in the hiv viral replication because of which what happens is proteate uh, pro, prote proteolytic cleavage of the hiv's gag and pol proteins is not taking place these two are polyproteins basically which is in the essential structure in the they are the components of the virus for that matter hiv virus so when that proteolytic cleavage is not taking place replication gets arrested because of which further replication will get stopped and the virus is inhibited in that particular cycle itself so these are the different kinds of uses in the biotechnology that you can actually see and you know the concepts of it when it comes to scope in biotechnology you have a lot of fields biotechnology uh, uh, techniques can be used in microbiology molecular biology then uh, biochemistry for that matter so everywhere there is an incorporation whenever you are talking about biology it is not or it is not without biotechnology in it so in the case of medical biotechnology you can you to see that there is something called as red biotechnology production of medicinal drugs which can be proteins nucleic acids for that matter then you have a lot of synthesis that is taking place with the help of microorganisms and also for therapeutic you, you use like i already told you humulin that is the human insulin it is uh, made with the help of the rdna technology so human insulin is replaced with the pig insulin and this was used and you know slowly what happened was because of which humulin got produced and now instead of pig insulin you are using the bacterial insulin it has made production of insulin much more uh, like you know you can produce more insulin in bulk at a less cost of price because bacteria replicate faster and another uh, 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 like you know uh, place where in biotechnology is very useful is gene therapy which has come up right now and you know a lot of uh, diseases uh, which are genetic in nature have been diagnosed and treatment also is being according to the uh, like you know what do you call it uh, uh, the biotechnological processes 
they're looking at uh, what do you call it um, the nanotechnology wherein you're using very small nanobots basically so as to treat cystic fibrosis which is actually a genetic disease so that is one of the methods wherein they're exploring gene therapy for that matter so in gene therapy what happens is manipulation of genes is done so that defective genes whatever is there it gets corrected and in this process the genes are inserted deleted modified so you can do like you know so frame shift uh, gene therapy can be done over here and then incorporation of otherwise incorporation of functional genes into an unspecified genomic location so that the mutated or the dysfunctional gene whatever is there is being replaced altogether so this is that is one place where you are using uh, like you know biotechnology and when it comes to industry a lot of industries work on only basis of biotechnology for example is alcohol industry then production of antibiotics whatever antibiotic today you are taking it is because of the principles of biotechnology that are being used in the production of antibiotics and a large scale of pharmaceutical drugs chemicals and there's uh, like you know by products or substrates whatever is necessary they are being produced by technologically with the help of microorganisms and different kinds of biotechnological techniques so lactic acid glycerin and uh, genetic engineering for that matter is being done so as to produce the better quality drugs and it has it is very uh, efficient and has proven to be very economic for production of the immobilized enzymes also and when it comes to environment today you know that we are facing a lot of environmental challenges as such global warming is one big uh, like you know issue that we are facing with and a lot of plastic that is being produced plastic takes hundreds and thousands of years to degrade a simple baby's diaper takes around 400 years to degrade and a plastic bag takes around 100 to 200 years to degrade so how is it that we are going to actually uh, help whatever has been you know polluted in the last 100 years say right from 1900s onwards and 1900 and 20 1930 onwards you get to see there still existing coal here you have tin cans the coke cans for that matter they are not biodegradable so how is it that we are going to combat such kind of thing and at the same time disasters or accidents you have seen you know oil spills then sewage that is being produced and then there's a lot of biogas that is methane that is being produced all of this you know there are certain bacteria which can actually cut down on the plastic there are certain bacteria that have been you know discovered that cut on the nylon ropes for that matter and plastic eating bacteria and oil spillage eating bacteria all of these were genetically engineered and then they were uh, in uh, like you know left into that particular environment so that we get less harmful uh, uh, products harmful less harmful to us as well as the environment around us so so this is a very important uh, 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 like you know field or aspect of uh, what do you call it uh, the biotechnology in fact with the help of biotechnology we can help improve our environment so that the future generations even us can live in a better and a safer environment and by technology and agriculture we have again seen you know different kinds of uh, like you know production of virus feed, uh, free genetic stock and you know insect resistant plant materials and then we have used uh, methods of biotechnology for uh, producing better and super crops for that matter then genetically modified uh, organisms to, uh, like you know and uh, plants for that matter that is your tomatoes and hybrid varieties of brinjal and uh, like you know so many the transgenic plants that have been produced basically so these techniques such as molecular breeding also that is one of the techniques that is there this helps in increasing and improving the process of crop that is a crop improvement then you have molecular markers then you have the restriction uh, fragment length for polymorphisms that is the rflp fragments basically then you have simple sequence repeats all of this provide tools for indirect selection of qualitative and quantitative qualities or traits so that you know they also help in studying the genotypic diversity now when it comes to the branches of biotechnology you have different kinds of branches again 
So when it comes to dread red biotechnology, it is for basically production of medical procedure, like you know, used in the medical procedures, production of new or novel drugs, stem cell research, and uh, gene therapy. So this is all you can call it as medical biotechnology. Green biotechnology is for agriculture and agricultural uh, processes basically so that you develop uh, like you know insect resistant uh, grains then you know help in uh, production of uh, genetically modified organisms for that matter or uh, plants. Blue biotechnology pertains to the marine or the aquatic environments this uh, so that you know noxious waterborne organisms whatever are there toxins are not are released if at all it's there, then, you know, you basically try to uh, cut it down. Also, like, you know, against the oil spills and all such kind of things. And white biotechnology or gray biotechnology, industrial biotechnology, production of new chemicals or development of new fuels for vehicles. So that, you know, your ve vehicles also release a lot of gases. This causes pollution. So that you use biotechnological techniques so that, you know, new fuel which releases less pollutants at the same time, more uh, economic. That is, you know, for example, if one liter of petrol in a particular car gives around like, you know, uh, only around five kilometers. Uh, you use biotechnological methods to produce a fuel wherein, you know, this particular one liter gives around 10 kilometers. And at the same time, your vehicular exhaust and, you know, your greenhouse emission is cut down. So your carbon emission, as it is called as. So this is where white biotechnology comes into place. Non-gene biotechnology is wherein you use with whole cells, tissues, individual organisms. So what happens is this includes the tissue culture, hybrid seed production, microbial fermentation, production of antibodies. And it also in involves immune chemistry. And when it comes to gene biotechnology, deals with genes, gene therapy, and genetic in engineering. So to summarize this particular lesson, we're going to see that biotechnology is a broad branch involving all techniques and all fields of biology. And it was there since 6,000, 4,000 BC, in fact, wherein, you know, bread was made, beer, cheese, making and preservation. So those techniques were seen since age old, in fact, and uh, they are the four uh, front, uh, you know, they are the four runners, in fact, for food employment as well as healthcare management. And you can see that all of this is based on the DNA that is there. All of it is found in the human chromosomes, with which we kind of manipulate and we try to get in a better result for ourselves as well as the environment around us. Cell fusion techniques have given rise to the production of monoclonal antibodies. And you have, uh, uh, like, you know, um, drugs that are being, you know, found out right now, which can block the enzymes, receptors, so that they will stop the disease at that particular point, wherever, you know, that particular enzyme or that particular reaction is stopped. And then you have, it can be used for, like, you know, biotechnology is applied for beneficial use usually. So red biotechnology is for production of medicinal drugs. And you have seen the others, green, blue, white, and uh, uh, the non-gene and the gene biotechnology. Industrial biotechnology is for production of alcohol and antibiotics. Environmental problems such as pollution, depletion of natural resources, non-renewable energy, biodiversity, conservation, all of this can be dealt with using biotechnology. So this is all about the lesson and the topic biotechnology for that matter, like, you know, in the scope of biotechnology. Now I will start with unit eight, which is molecular techniques in gene manipulations. So when you see that, you get to know that, you know, basically all of us are made up of cells. Cells have chromosomes, nuclei, chromosomes. And on those chromosomes, you have genes. So in case you have an issue, then, you know, you can do gene manipulation so that this will help in production of recombinant DNA. This results in the formation of monoclonal antibodies. And at the same time, you can do 
production of uh, what do you call it uh, multiplication of the antibodies that are present or multiplication of the gene product itself that is done by a technique which is known as pcr that is polymerase chain reaction wherein the gene amplification is taking place now first time gene manipulation was actually used in agriculture for the improvement of the quality of the plants so it was seen in 2001 in native corn that is mexican corn and now you know you use of this in human beings is being done right now but it's a complicated process and of course there's a lot of research going on based on that particular uh what do you call it uh, 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 uh genetics in fact so as you see, today you use the uh, bacteria for production of human hormones such as insulin, like, you know, very common example. Then uh, you use, uh, uh, like, one is the hormones, that is the insulin. Then you can use E. coli to produce the interferons, like I just told you. And you can produce human growth hormone and other hormones. A lot of stuff can be produced. A lot of enzymes can be produced, uh, like, you know, so that, you know, uh, for example, lactic acid is produced by the lactic acid basil this is this uses you know biotechnological methods and for fermentation alcohol fermentation you use uh, uh, what do you call it uh, uh, microbes microorganisms so there are a, and basic example for that you know for that matter if you see the curds in your house the curdling of the milk so that you know the milk turns into curds is we using the starter culture what is the starter culture that is uh, that is being used a spoon of other curds you just add so all of this so you have a lot of uh, so in over here i'm just like kind of talking about the biotechnology part this is not where exactly genetic manipulation is taking place but as such you get to see you, you're using this uh, a method to produce a different uh, different Byproducts. So for uh, bacteria, hormone production, that is insulin, human growth hormone, interferons, etc. So you have RDNA technology doing this. At the same time, production of monoclonal and polyclonal antibodies. So genetic manipulation helps us to create gene maps or different organisms. And then three steps. That is, you have to isolate the DNA then in, from a particular organism. And then insert this DNA into a vector or another host. And then transfer this vector by transfection or transformation into a host. So that host, vector, and the other DNA that is uh, of, uh, like, you know, which is required is being uh, inside that particular host. So this is all about, uh, what do you call it, uh, the... Uh, genetic manipulation methods basically so when it comes to the molecular techniques in gene man uh, mole uh, like you know manipulations you cut dna molecules using restriction and uh, like you know endonucleases then joined together by another enzyme which is a dna ligase and then you have vectors so which actually help in uh, propagating this cloned dna so you have DNA sequencing, promotion, uh, the, you know, the promotion of the expression of the clone vectors, then facilitating the purification of the cloned gene products and uh, then the localization of proteins. So again, vectors are of two types, that is cloning and the expression vectors. Let me just share the screen with you so that you can start seeing. So when it comes to vector, what exactly is a vector? And uh, these are the cloning vectors, basically, that are there. So vector is a DNA molecule that is used for transporting the exogenous DNA into the host cell. Again, the characteristics should be that, you know, it should have an origin of replication, which is known as an oocyte, so that the vector is having, it is capable of autonomous repl replication inside the host organism. And it should be able to accept so it should have a restriction site wherein, you know, DNA molecule is inserted into that particular vector. It should have a selectable marker so that, you know, you can see or screen that particular recombinant organism as such. And this can be an antibiotic resistance gene because of which, you know, what happens is with that particular uh, resistance gene in it, it gets uh, like, you know, easily identified. 
it should be small in size but it should be able to insert a large uh, like you know it should be able to integrate a large size of the insert so when it comes to cloning cloning in biotechnology is basically a process in which organisms or copies of the cells or the dna fragments are done so process is digestion of the dna fragments and uh, the vector dna with the help of restriction enzymes and then that is the restriction endonucleases you use dna ligases to like you no know, ligate or join together the target segment along with the vector dna then this should be introduced into the host cell for pro pro propagation and then this whole process involves like i told you this is how it is done so bacterium with the plasmid which is present basically and then you have the recombinant dna over here isolation of plasmid dna dna containing gene of interest then you have the gene inserted into the plasmid over here over here dna chromosome gene of interest is taken so this is both of them are treated with uh, what do you call it restriction endonucleases then and you also add dna ligase to it so you have the dna gene of interest incorporated into the plasmid which is again put back into the bacterial cell using either transformation or transfection and then this is the recombinant bacterium which is present and then for identification of the desired clo uh, cloning you have different kinds of uh, applications basically you know that is like i told you antibiotic resistance for example that and then you get to see copies of the genes this is incorporated into another host basically so that you get to see the plant takes in this particular recombinant uh, bacterium as such because of which you can either clean up the toxic wastes basic research re uh, crop resistance all of this can be done over here copies of the protein if they are produced so you can see that you know human growth hormone is produced because of this from the e coli so it is taken then uh, for standard growth if this is incorporated again because of which growth can be enhanced and uh, like you know blood clot uh, like you know proteases serum proteases are produced because of this so that blood clots are removed so all this can be done with the help of a cloning vectors so like i told you small in size should be compatible have should have uh, origin of replication must possess a restriction site introduction of donor and it should not intervene with the self replicating property selectable marker that is uh, uh, antibiotic resistance mostly is used and uh, donor fragment should not interfere uh, with the self replicating property of the cloning vector selectable marker is added again so this is one of the example of uh, cloning vectors for that matter so in your book it is given uh, like you know the pbr322 that is plus a uh, plasmid bolivar and rodriguez pbr322 is given basically so these plasmid vectors you have different kinds of features right like i told you so you should have a set of sequence of nucleotides which help in you know replication initiation then autonomous replication inside the cell it should take place then foreign dna should be attached to the ori site itself so that you know replication starts from there and then you also should have a cloning site which is for the analysis for the genetic engineering then you have a vector dna at the site that gets digested foreign dna gets inserted with the help of the restriction endonucleases and then you have this uh, so you have plasmids which are actually very good uh, vectors basically they naturally occurring extra chromosomal dna basically which help in um, yes so they are the first vectors to be used in gene cloning they are naturally occurring and not autonomously replicating uh, extra chromosomal double stranded circular dna molecules but uh, then they are present in bacteria archaea eukaryotes sizes are from around 1 to uh, that is you know 250 that is 100 to 250 kilo bases basically and uh, then you see that you know a dna insert of up to almost 10 kilobytes uh, like you know kilo kilo bases can be cloned in the plasmids they have high copy number that is useful for production of more number of plasmids basically and a low copy number plasmids are exploited under certain conditions like cloned gene products wherein protein whatever is produced is toxic to the cells so both the both the type of plastids having high copy number and low co copy number are used 
for production in our DNA technology. And plasmids encode the proteins that are essential for their replication. These protein encoding genes are located near the oocytes again. So this is about the plastids. And one more thing is, you know, basic criteria is to have, uh, what do you call it? Uh, they, you know, they should be able to be easily isolated from the host cells. And it should have a single restriction site for one or more restriction uh, enzymes. And insertion of a linear foreign DNA at one end of the site should uh, take place so that it does not alter the replication properties. So it can be reintroduced into the host cell. All of this is taken into consideration. So over here, they have actually given you uh, given an example of uh, PBR322 for that matter. So I'll just like kind of... Uh, um, I'll just like kind of talk about this particular, uh, like, you know, what do you call it, PBR322, in fact. Please give me a moment. I would like to continue the class for the next 10 minutes so that this particular topic will get over. Uh, so it will take another 15 to 20 minutes easily. That is, you know, after 2.30. So up to 2.45, I will continue the class. So this is uh, the plasmid uh, PBR322 basically. So you have the origin of replication over here. And then you have two genes that confer the resistance that are present basically to different kinds of antibiotics. That is your uh, ampicillin resistance gene over here and the tetracycline resistance gene over here. And you also have uh, around, uh, what do you call it? There are more than 10 enzymes with unique cleavage sites on the uh, PBR322 genome basically. So this was named after the scientists that discovered it and uh, uh, so they are a vector group of plasmids usually most widely used as the cloning vectors. So PBR322 is modified now so you get around PBR318 and 320. So it's the most widely used model system for prokaryotic transcription and translation. So it is around 4,361.62 base pairs in length, has an origin of replication, which is uh, derived from a plasmid. With this, this is the origin of replication, uh, which is related to naturally occurring plasmid that is called E1. It possesses around genes for antibiotic resistance and tetracycline resistance, and more than 10 enzymes with uniquely with sites on the PBR322 genome. So you can do cloning at HIND3 site and that is one. And then you also have the, uh, like, you know, this, uh, like, you know, if at all cleavage is done in that particular place, you have loss of tetracycline resistance over here. Another uh, vector you can use that is, uh, like, you know, you have PBR327, again, derived from this basic PBR322. So if at, if at all you delete nucleotides between 1427 to 4, uh, 2000, uh, 2516, so what happens is reduction of the sizes taking place. And then, anti uh, like, you know, they also, again, uh, possess the two antibiotic resistance genes. Again, like I told you, several unique recognition sequences, ECO, R1, BAM, H1, around 10 enzymes, uh, uh, like, you know, cleavage sites are present over here. And then you have a plasmid, so you, that is your University of California and uh, PUC, that is your PUC-19 and uh, 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 that is one thing, this is the PBR-322, like I told you. PBR322 and advantages of plasmids and disadvantages are there. 
So in PUC vectors, what is it? PUC stands for a plasmid uh, University of California, basically. So this is the vector base. And in this, uh, it's small in size, again, can, really, uh, can carry relatively large DNA inserts. And uh, in the host cells such as PUC18 and PUC19, you have around 500 copies per cell. So that much uh, plasmid can replicate basically and produce so many copies in one particular cell. So that produ it produces many clones of the inserted DNA fragments in it. Now, when it comes to the advantages and the disadvantages of uh, plasmids, you get to see that your disadvantages is that large fragments cannot be cloned. Only size of up to 10 kilobytes can be inserted. Standard methods of transformation are not exactly uh, possible. Now, when it comes to bacteriophages, bacteriophages are those they infect the bacterial cells. They are the phage or the viruses that infect the bacterial cells. Most common uh, bacterial phages are the phage lambda and the M13 phage. Around a maximum of 53 kilo, uh, like, you know, daltons of DNA can be packaged into this particular, particular phage. So again, small size, they're used for single gene insertion. Rarely larger than 2 kilobytes can be used basically for insertion base. Uh, then you get to see that phage lambda is for uh, studying bacterial viruses, uh, like, you know, viruses for DNA cloning. And you have uh, the M13 phage also that is present. If the vector DNA is too small, it cannot exactly be packaged into the phage. So then again, you get to see that the silk type, that is the phage virus, has around 50 kilobyte linear DSDNA having protein coats. So this phage DNA is injected into the cell and you have around five prime and three prime sticking ends. So the five prime end of the DNA has around 12 nucleotides long complementary base sequences, which are, uh, which are similar to that of the cos sequences. Again, bacteriophages have uh, replication by two different kinds of cycle, which is one is lytic cycle and another is lysogenic cycle. So in the case of lytic and the lysogenic cycle, just please give me a minute. I will try to get in that particular picture. So when uh, bacteriophages uh, replicate by lytic and lysogenic cycles, you get to see that uh, Right. So what happens is phage DNA in the lytic cycle. This is the lytic cycle. This is the lysogenic cycle. In the this in this lytic and the lysogenic cycle, the phage DNA attaches to the host cell, injects the DNA. So this is the bacterial chromosome, and the phage, uh, like you know, the outer, uh, uh, like you know, uh, the whole capsid and the uh, sheath and the base plate, all of it comes out. It is only the phage DNA that is getting incorporated. Now, this circularizes and either enters into the lysogenic cycle or what happens is production of new DNA, new phage DNA and proteins are synthesized. These get assembled into virions. Then what happens is it because of the cell lysis takes place, releasing all the phage virions, virions. And at the same time, even the capsid protein and the sheath, everything else, you know, what is necessary for the phage to the bacterial phage to be produced is product, uh, produced because of which what happens is you know you have a complete bacteriophage produced again which might enter into the lytic cycle or again this dna circularizes enters into the lysogenic cycle wherein what happens is this phage dna integrates within the bacterial chromosome by recombination so it becomes a prophage this prophage what happens is after li like you know many cell divisions so bacterial uh, replication is taking place, reproduction is taking place. Finally, what happens is, you know, it again, like, you know, is integrated with the bacteria. Otherwise, what happens is it comes out in the form of, uh, like, you know, this um, production of the phage DNA in the, uh, takes place. And this will come out excised from the bacterial chromosome. And after another recombination event, it can enter into the lytic cycle. So this is what happens. 
in the lytic and the lysogenic cycle basically so this recombinant phage uh, lambda phages that are available or that are able to transform the e coli at high efficiency is it is achieved by the in vitro packaging system that is mimicked uh, by the wild type of phage dna so which is actually packaged in the protein coat so this results in a higher infection efficiency so several cloning vectors have been developed by just modifying this particular lambda phage genome you also have replacement phage vectors or lambda vectors so what happens is the lambda genome that is present at some points the lambda genome that is present at the uh, phage lambda gene this is the phage lambda with the dna the capsid and uh, this is the protein code basically this is the tail proteins that are present this is the phage dna so this lambda genome contains genes at the central segment that are required for the lysogenic cycle but not for lytic fusion so you can use replacement lambda vectors by replacing this dna segment with r gene or dna of interest so when this is done so foreign dna up to 23 kilo uh, base pairs in length can be used in such kind of vectors and they are normally used for making genomic dna libraries example is embl3 and embl4 that is given in your textbook and also you have insertion phage uh, or the insertion lambda vectors in this what happens is uh, you can uh, uh, you know these vectors are used for making cdna libraries by modification of the lambda vectors basically so that you know they kind of uh, uh, so that you know uh, uh, they permit insertional cloning into the cl1 gene basically so example is a, uh, like you know lambda gt10 which is around 43 kilo base pairs in lambda the dds dna that is used for cloning fragments that are only around 7 to 10 kilo base pairs long so insertion uh, of this foreign dna inactivates the c1 gene and then it generates a cl minus phage then this is uh, again you know recombinant cl plus phage is present plaque formation is seen in the host cells which are e coli and then formation of the pla uh, clear plaques in the e, e coli is also seen because of it then you do the screening then you know lysogeny mutation loss and uh, such kind of tests to easily obtain or select the phage gt10 plaques which are selected then so when it come to the other different kinds of vectors you have cosmids they are again plasmids capable of incorporating the bacteriophage lambda dna segment at the cohesive uh, like you know terminal sites that is the cos sites they are necessary for efficient packaging of the dna into the phage particles and then large dna fragments of size varying from 25 to 45 kilo base pairs can be cloned packaged into the lambda permits the foreign dna fragments or the genes to be introduced into the host organism by transduction again advantages is that you have multiple cloning sites you have inducible lag gene promoter which is present basically blue white colony selection all of this can be done now we have phage fed vectors let me just like see what is phage fed vectors or oh, this is the phage fed vectors basically so what happens is they are the artificially uh, 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 programmed using the uh, phage plus plus uh, uh, phages plus plasmids so it has a multiple cloning site lag promoter origin of replication then you have a blue script which is uh, what do you call it uh, 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 i i k s is derived from the plasmid puc19 and uh, and also you you have a polylinker dna or a, a, a gene that is attached to it with uh, you know with the transcription of lag z and then you have different kinds of uh, restriction sites for kpn1 to sac1 so this particular uh, artificial vector has different kinds of multiple cloning sites which are uh, flanked by t3 and t7 promoters 
they help in inducing the lac operon also upstream of the lac said region you have uh, e coli complements so this is uh, used for selection of chimeric vectors using the criterion of white colonies formed against the blue colonies so that what happens is you know no foreign dna gets um, inserted if at all uh, you get to see a difference in the white and blue colors so this is about uh, the fragment when it comes to the artificial chromo uh, uh, like you know chromosomes so you have quite a number of artificial chromosomes that are produced first one is the bacterial artificial chromosome i would like to finish this lesson so another 10 minutes of time i would be needing so in the bacterial artificial chromosomes there again similar to the e coli plasmid vectors having origins and a genes that encode the ori binding sites as well so this is critical for the bacterial artificial chromosome replication again they are derived from naturally occurring f plasmids that are present and uh, f the f factor plasmids basically and then you can insert about dna which is around 150 to 350 kilo bases and uh, so what happens is because of which you can um, advantages is you can insert large sequences of dna without any kind of rearrangement that can take place for uh, studying genetic disorders basically it can be used bacterial artificial chromosomes high yield of dna clones is obtained but then disadvantages they are present in low copy numbers then the eukaryotic dna inserts having repetitive sequences are not exactly stable in the bacterial artificial chromosome because of its deletion or rearrangement risk is there when it when it comes to the uh, bacteriophage artificial chromosome vectors let me see if i got that no i do not have that particular site anyway you please listen to me so what happens is in bacteriophages p1 is period derived artificial vectors that is the pac vectors they have large genomes so it can accommodate larger dna sequences or fragments for that matter so that can around 110 to 115 kilo bases of the linear dna this plasmid vector is cleaved so that you get two vector arms which can take up to around 100 kilo base pairs of foreign dna each and then this is uh, ligated packaged into a p1 coat protein in vitro inside the cell this recombinant uh, p1 phage is then allowed to be absorbed by the host cell because of which again when dna is injected into the cell cellularized and it is amplified and this is one method and use of another another bacteriophage t4 in the in vitro packing system with t1 vectors helps in the recovery of inserts of this particular 122 kilo base pairs in size later they can be combined to develop the p1 derived artificial chromosome cloning system now when it comes to the yeast artificial chromosome system what happens is again up to 200 kilo base pairs of the uh, like you know dna can be cloned and inserted used for cloning inside the eukaryotic cells inside the eukaryotic uh, host cell that is so and it has a yeast telomere also so you have a yeast centromere sequence that is a sen sequence which is present at which which allows proper segregation during the meiosis and then again ori site is bacterial in origin so you have both yeast and bacterial cells that can be used as the host over here so ori sequence that is the ars uh that is the autonomously uh, like you know what do you call it uh, uh autonomously replicating sequence allows the vectors to replicate inside the yeast cells and restriction sites with uh using the foreign dna can be inserted and for cloning what you do is a circular yac is cut with an extra restriction enzyme then with the in multiple cloning sites basically and this can be cut between the two tails that is c e telomeres 
and you can also attach high molecular weight DNA and uh, ligate it uh, to the two arms basically. So large amount of DNA can be cloned. Physical maps of uh, large genomes can be uh, constructed, but the disadvantage is that overall efficiency is low. Cloned DNA is also yield is also low. Now. Uh, yeast uh, resulting YAC, that is, you know, yeast artificial chromosome cannot be transfected directly into the yeast cells and they have to be treated first and then that is when, you know, you can, uh, like, you know, create this particular yeast artificial chromosomes. So, when it comes to cloning and the cloning methods, another five minutes and your class will be over. Please be patient. So, we have different kinds of cloning and cloning methods, basically, which is naturally occurring the reproduction and then you have clones that is the exact copy of the particular uh, what do you call it uh, 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 cell for that matter or uh, like you know uh, you know um, the organism so cloning of single celled organisms can be done for example organisms like bacteria yeast so you can inoculate and then you can slowly of the somatic cell nuclear transfer is used in the cell stem cell uh, research so that you can start uh, uh, what do you call it uh, uh, cloning or producing the same kind of cells basically with the help of high call like, you know isolation of colonies and each of the colonies arises from one single potentially clonal distinct cell so these cells are again gathered for different kinds of purposes so it is stem cell harvesting basically for human development and uh, disease treatment. So you can treat uh, diabetes, Alzheimer's, all of this using stem cell therapy that is your embryonic stem cells. So what happens is egg reacts with the transferred nucleus and this is genetically identical to the diseased uh, person basically. Uh, then the embryo forms a blastocyst. This becomes, uh, this has the potential to form the whole uh, like, you know, uh, uh, any cell in the body for that matter. So somatic cell, uh, cell uh, nuclear transfer therapy is a good method for even producing agricultural animals for food consumption. So cloning of sheep, cattle, goats and pigs can be done. So food shortage is not there basically. Now we have seen dolly. How is it that you know we are going to generate dolly? So this is done by uh, like you know uh, reproductive uh, what do you call it? Um, so this is the som somatic cell uh, body cell having the desired genes the nucleus is taken egg cell with the enucleated cell basically and then fusion is taking place and this is how clone is produced so this is how dolly was produced basically so other cells from the donor sheep cells were taken cultured to switch off the genes become dormant the unfertilized egg cells were taken from another sheep enucleated that is removing of the nucleus and then step three is fusion of the nucleus and the egg cell using electricity. And then resulting embryo was implanted into another sheep, that is surrogate mother gestation. That is how Dolly was produced. So when it comes to the last part of our topic today, that is the gene cloning, you get to see that in gene cloning, you have the cloning vector. Again, molecular cloning only. <clears throat> you have the amplified gene products that are taken basically and in this you know you take up the linearization of this restriction enzyme uh, endonucleoside uh, like you know en uh, endonuclease enzyme cleavage and then over here dna is taken fragments again in uh, like you know with the restriction in uh, endonucleases you have the denome frag fragments ligation Collection of the different vectors of with the inserted pieces of the cellular DNA, introduction of the vectors into the suitable host cells, and collection of the cell colonies, each containing the donor vector with different genetic insert. So fragmentation, ligation, transfection, screening, or selection. All of this is taken place so that you know when uh, successful transfected dna is there along with the host dna that is gene in uh, gene of interest along with the uh, cloning vector so if this is done you know again uh, what happens is dna of interest after you have taken all of this it is uh, isolated suitable size fragment is taken then you have different kinds of techniques such as the chemical sensitization electroporation insertion into the host and again, you know, collection for the colonies, desired sequence is inserted. And 
you get what you want. That is gene of interest in inside the vector cell. So again, modern cloning vectors include selected antibiotic resistance markers, which allow only the transfected vectors to grow further. So this is all about uh, this particular uh, lesson. Your uh, 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 like you know uh, the molecular techniques in gene manipulations. So summarization is uh, vectors are you know used for uh, they are the autonomously replicating genetic elements. They are uh, of different types and sources. Uh, based on that, they are plasmids, bacteriophages, cosmids, phagmids, and artificial chromosomes. They are naturally occurring extra chromosomal double stranded DNA molecules that replicate autonomously within the bacterial cells. And then after that, they replicate in E. coli. It's the most uh, famous, uh, what do you call it, uh, vector basically. And uh, the bacterium which can have the vector in it. And a single plasmid may not be able to possess all the features which is necessary for DNA cloning. Now, these infect the bacterial cells. They are used as cloning vectors, which are small size plasmids are the best for the gene, single gene insertion. Insert rarely larger than the two kilobytes, uh, kilobase pairs, basically. Viral DNA replicates initially are bidirectional and subsequently they result in the rolling circle model, that is linear multimers of the virion. virion. The lambda genome has a gene that is homologous to that of the E. coli chromosome. They are again formed by inserting the cos sequence of the phage into a small plasmid vector. So this forms uh, phages with plasmids. Then vectors for cloning DNA in the bacterial cells have high to moderate number of replicas. And uh, then construction of this yeast artificial chromosomes provides more advantages over cloning in the bacterial cells. So this can help us in cloning very large DNA fragments for different kinds of purposes. So this is all for today's lesson. Tomorrow, I like you know the next week that is the twentieth, I will deal with the animal cell culture and the subsequent lessons that is the stem cell as well as the gene therapy. So thank you so much.